Our speaker is Edgar Roberts, the Emeritus Professor of English, Lehman College of the City, University of New York. Edgar graduated from the Minneapolis Public Schools, served for a year and a half in the U.S. Army, and attended the University of Minnesota, uh, graduating in 1951. He received his MA from Minnesota in 52 and his PhD in 1960. After studying in England for a year on a Fulbright scholarship, he taught at Wayne State University in Detroit and then at Hunter College in the, in the Bronx, which was renamed Lehman College in 1968, from 1961 through 1991. He published an edition of John Gay's The Beggar's Opera with the University of Nebraska Press in 1968 and Henry Fielding's The Author's Farce with Nebraska in 1969. The tenth edition of Literature, an Introduction to Reading and Writing, now with Professor Robert Zwick, was published by Pearson earlier this year, and the 13th edition of his Writing About Literature will be published by Pearson this fall. His session today is entitled, I'm Now Taking Advanced Literature Courses, So What Should I Be Writing About in My Essays? Ed, as soon as you're ready to begin, I'll turn it over to you. Window. Okay. Do we have you there? I, I'm here. Can you hear me? All right. I can hear you just fine. I'm going to let you take it away, and I'll come back in at the end with questions. Okay. Is everything set? Everybody will be able to hear? Uh, hello? It's yep. A, it's a, hello. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this afternoon, I should like to discuss a problem that many students experience who are taking advanced literature courses and who find themselves faced with writing assignments in which they want to excel. As advanced students, they are expected to create something that is advanced. Depending on the difficulty or lack of it of the major work that they are analyzing, however, they may not be sure about what they might include in their writing assignments. The easiest thing for them to do is to fall back on the solution that tempts many students who are gaining experience but who are as yet not considerably experienced. The easiest thing, unless they are given specific instructions about what they might be expected to write, is simply to describe and summarize the work on which the assignment is based. The pattern of thought in this process is to move towards something like, this is here, and that is here, and then these things happen, and then those things happen. This pattern represents really a, di a diversionary way of writing about literature, and it usually results in covering the assigned number of pages but it does not lead the student in an advanced course toward anything that is intellectually challenging or creative. It is insufficient for a student in an advanced course. There are some activities that our advanced students can undertake, however, to enable them to produce something that actually is advanced. Questions, introducing elements of thought that will give them insights into the work and what might be done to help them create and develop ideas about the topics that can lead to interesting and unique essays. There's no guarantee, for sometimes their conclusions will provide little more than a short overview that does not offer the connections in which readers of student writing are interested. But there are a number of things that students may try, doors that they might open, vistas that they might see. One obvious avenue of exploration is the biography of the writer of the work they are studying. This avenue may lead somewhere, or it may not, depending on the degree of connection that our student may be able to make. Connection and relationships are vital here. As an example, let us see what happens if our student is taking a course in restoration drama, the age of the heroic play, and is given the assignment of writing about John Dryden's critical work of dramatic poesy and essay that Dryden first wrote in about 1666 and published in 1668. Dryden's essay is not an easy read. As a matter of fact, it's a hard read. It involves thoughts about dramatic topics and structures that are remote historically, and it frequently includes critical illustrations that were originally written in Latin and that Dryden reproduces in Latin. Usually our students will be using a modern text that translates such examples, but even so, the references to writers and works are likely to seem remote to today's students of dramatic history. Nevertheless, there are things that can possibly provide wedges for the student of literature. In 1668, the Elizabethan and Jacobean harvest of drama was 50 to 60 years in the past. 
The political turbulence during the reign of Charles I, including the interregnum, was over, and the relative stability that Dryden hoped for during the reign of Charles II had begun. Let us remember, however, that Dryden had been a small boy during the 1630s. Part of that is, that is to realize that one sort of imagined that he was never young, and that when Charles I had been beheaded in 1649, Dryden was not yet out of his teens. Having lived through the interregnum, he was taking up the profession of writing plays at the time when Charles assumed the English throne. And in 1660, the restoration had begun. By the end of the 1660s, Dryden had established himself as a major dramatist of the London stage and was about to become the third English poet laureate. As background during the 1660s, the English had been engaged in fighting the Dutch in the so-called Second Dutch War, which had seen the successful battle of the English over the Dutch at the Battle of Lowestoft in the summer of 1665. This was a great victory for the English, although later on during this war there was also a great defeat or two. At the beginning of the essay on dramatic poesy, the battle that Dryden describes as taking place was the Battle of Lowestoft in the very east of England, many miles from London. But the naval cannons, according to Dryden, could nevertheless be heard, and it was this distant rumble that he describes in perhaps the most memorable passage from the essay. And I quote, everyone went following the sound as his fancy led him. And leaving the town almost empty, some took towards the park, some crossed the river, others down it, all seeking the noise in the depths of silence. If we take this scene as a backdrop of actual occurrences in the 17th century, we and our hypothetical student can make some connections between Dryden's dramatic poesy and the developing student essay. What we can see is that although sometimes it is necessary to ignore historical and biographical details connected to the works about which we write, it is possible to connect relevant events of the time with fruitful study of the actual works. Our student should assume that Dryden has provided an invitation to make this connection. Another aspect of the times of Dryden is the common observation that writers like Dryden and Pope lived in what we often call the Augustan age, a period that in ancient Rome began with Augustus Caesar, who was the first Roman emperor, you'll remember, reigned for four decades from 29 BC to 14 in the Common Era. Here is a fruitful avenue to explore. Historically, during this period, Rome developed militarily and politically by taking control over most of the areas touching the Mediterranean. In fact, some students of ancient history considered the development of Rome as a creative time when the new empire actually controlled the waters and shores of the Mediterranean as though they were comparable to a very large Roman lake. The writers and thinking thinkers of the 17th century optimistically extended this analogy to the countries touching the Atlantic and Indian oceans. Just as Rome had developed its empire in the centuries following Augustus, so could England and other European powers think of this new world as being analogous to the Mediterranean. Dryden often selected stories and characters from faraway regions of the world and developed them in his so-called heroic drama, for which he perceived a taste among his restoration audiences. His conclusion was clearly that after the upsets of the first century uh, in the, before the Common Era, Rome had created a peaceful region during the two centuries following the creation of the empire. The idea was that England was uh, forming a comparable Augustan age in the much larger regions of the Atlantic and Southern Asia. What we see in the essay is therefore a realistic application of the idea of empire. The condition, of course, was that England needed a time of political stability and control in which to develop the arts of peace. Certainly, we can find this idea operating in the essay. There had been times of war and instability. Now, there was a time and an overwhelming need for stability and peace. The form of Dryden's essay, with not one, with not simply one, just one view being presented, but four, represented by the views of Dryden's four speakers, takes the form of just how drama should figure into this newly shaping world. There was recognition that dramatists would be a part of the newly developing society and art world that would become a part of the new age that the victory over the Dutch on the day of the essays would introduce. 
And the idea, the idea was this, what sort of drama would it be? There was the precedent of classical drama. Then there was the French drama, which had been reaching its heights during the time when the English were being beleaguered by their civil wars. Thus, the new drama of the English was not yet defined, for it was a composite of many works in progress. Should the plays of the English be written in poetry or in prose? And if in poetic lines, whether these lines should be done in blank verse, as Shakespeare had done, or whether the lines should be rhymed? Should the new drama follow the unities, unlike Shakespeare's plays, which would sometimes compress years of history within a single play? Dryden's, essays, or Dryden's essay considers such matters that our hypothetical student would find an abundance of issues to consider as a serious aspect of what Dryden felt to be important in the new drama. In short, the subject of the new drama, presumably to be written by English dramatists and then sent to the corners of the new world, at least so the dramatists probably hoped, was a big topic worthy of analysis by students in subsequent centuries. The idea of all such considerations, of course, is that the student's use of such historical matters should lead toward the establishment of connections. Only connect, as E.M. Forster wrote in the novel Howard's End. The introduction of historical details should have a direct connection in a work like Dryden's essay with the issues that are to be considered in the student's essay. The introduction of any biographical details should not be a separate consideration, but should be directly involved with the analysis and comparison of the literature that Dryden brings out. Relationship, connection, these are the goals of the student writer. The same applies to another poem, a sonnet, that also brings out the contrast between the old world and the new. This is this William Cullen Bryant sonnet, written more than a century and a half in 1829, after Dryden's essay. This is to Cole, the painter, departing for Europe. Thomas Cole, we might remember, is considered the founder of the Hudson River School of Painters. Cole and Bryant were good friends, a fact observed in Asher Duran's painting, Kindred Spirits, which Durand painted after Cole's untimely death of pneumonia in 1848. But in 1829, Cole had embarked on a three-year trip to Europe with the intention of studying the works of European painters. Interestingly, Brian Sonnet contrasts Cole's work with, as an American painter, although he was originally English, with the European works that he was planning to study. In this respect, Bryant's Sonnet is comparable to Dryden's, es Dryden's essay so much more brief, of course. As Dryden thinks of the future development of English literature as it was to permeate the new world, Bryant thinks of Cole as a possessor of, and I quote, that earlier, wilder image of America, and considers Cole's voyage to Europe as a means of conveying, and I quote, a living image of our own bright land to the Europeans. In other words, Cole was going abroad to learn European art but he also had a wilder image to keep bright. It would seem that this image might give an American student something to consider and develop in the way of an idea for an essay on the strands of thought in Bryant's sonnet. Another work that might prove valuable for suggesting means of developing fruitful thoughts for writing is Poe's The Mask of the Red Death, a story that launches readers into sensationalism and almost literally uh, insanity. A student proposing to write about the mask might begin with the question, what is this story about? Let us remember that early in the 1840s, when Poe published the story, there were no ways in which the story could conveniently be transferred to film, and so Poe had used nothing, nothing but words and images to convey his powerful effect of dread and horror. The Red Death, some kind of silently invasive killer, which no one at the time could define precisely, for Louis Pasteur, who was still a very young man at that time, was perhaps to be compared with plague or with cholera. Poe was reminding readers that malevolent forces were at work in the world that nullified all human actions. Once the Red Death comes to the party, that is the, the party uh, of the thousand guests, uh, no one can get away safely. Any human attempt to prevent the Red Death is futile even the attempts of the most powerful human beings, for the Red Death is supreme, and it renders human beings powerless. It is a fact that Poe wrote similar stories for 
convenient comparison. The fall of the House of Usher is one example, along with the Black Cat, the Cask of Amontillado, the Telltale Heart, and others. The student here might introduce one or two of these stories as a means of emphasizing that Poe's constant emphasis of the eerie in life was a means of fulfilling his idea that literature was to create a single strong and overpowering effect. The weird, the abnormal, the macabre uh, was the means that led him to his creative use of his theory. As a means of contrast, of course, the subject matter of these stories created some of the interesting variety of subject matter that Poe used to create all his effects. Another interesting work for comparison is Chinua Achebe's first novel, Things Fall Apart, of 1958. This is, a, this is a novel seen from the standpoint of a major social class, the Igbo or Igbo in Nigeria during the latter part of the 19th century. The Igbo society is shown to have been male-dominated, with the controlling men having a number of separate wives and with virtually life and death control over their families. The central character is Okonkwo, whose principal claim to recognition and power is that he is a strong wrestler. In short, the Igbo society is shown as being far from ideal, but it works, and it creates stability. When white missionaries come to the Igbo people and territory, however, the major conflicts start, and these are finally the ultimate cause of things falling apart. The end result is that Okonkwo, who has committed an act of murder, in fact was not inconsistent with the previous values of the Igbo power structure, has committed a great crime in the eyes of the outside religious and political leaders. With his world collapsing around him, he commits suicide. Indeed, things have indeed fallen apart. It is clear that things fall apart is about the conflicting social and moral values during the colonial period of the 19th century. When European countries invaded Africa because of its wealth of raw materials, primarily, it was then that the European powers tried to bring the African people into line with European moral and social values. This conflict does not idealize the Igbo society, for Achebe presents but does not glorify that society. Also, one might compare things fall apart with Conrad's Heart of Darkness in which the emphasis on the economic exploitation of the natives of the Congo is made foremost. They're there to get ivory. Certainly, a student might illuminate things fall apart by emphasizing the many differences that one finds between it and Heart of Darkness. An interesting aspect of these differences is that Achebe wrote an essay claiming that Conrad's view of black Africans was racist. But that is indeed another story and as a potential topic for another advanced essay. It is clear that there are many ideas that students might pursue when put to their own devices in writing. The idea is constantly to make tests of what topics might be, and to keep analyzing and adopting topics when they offer possibilities of discussion, and rejecting them when they do not. In many respects, picking a topic for an essay is a process of trial and error the process is, but the process is nevertheless valuable, and it is half the battle, and it can ultimately be the basis of superior essays and advanced courses. I thank you very, very much for listening, and um, I uh, will be glad to uh, handle any questions that come up. And uh, I thank you again. I hope uh, all. The, uh, I hope everything could be heard well, and uh, I'm ready to handle questions. All right. Well, it usually takes a few minutes for questions to kind of uh, roll in, so I thought um, I might just go ahead and uh, go ahead and start. Okay. I, um, you know, I've I've used your book for a long time, and I've always loved the the preface and introduction because it just makes it sound like um, like writing or reading reading literature is is sort of a way. For students to go on um, on a bit of a a bit of a journey, and I know your talk today is about um, advanced uh, literature courses, um, but I but I know you do a lot of work with um, with less advanced students as well, and I I wondered if you um, might comment 
a little bit about um, some some ways of getting uh, getting less advanced students writing and, and thinking about literature. What are some good ideas for getting them off on the right track? Well, I uh, can, if you use, use my books, I can remember I can recommend them very very highly. Uh, there are many ways in which uh, students can um, uh, handle uh, literature topics uh, and. Uh, uh, you uh, encounter with beginning students the, the biggest problem of all is, of course, they retell stories uh, or they point out mm -hmm. what's going on. That is, they, they resort to uh, summary, uh, and that pretty much is what does it uh, for them. And therefore, if you can have them talk about some ideas that occur in the work or if you can make comparisons and contrasts, uh, you can. Uh, uh, provide them with information that gives them something to go on that they didn't have before. And I think that's, that's really the, the, basic, uh, the basic sort of thing that, uh, uh, that students can, can be taught. And uh, there are just uh, endless uh, topics that uh, uh, can get, going, get them going. And I think that many students who are you know, freshmen in freshman classes are, are sort of uh, surprised when they realize that, uh, hey, there are a lot of things that can be done rather than just reading the story and saying, hey, I know all about this now. Uh, but um, uh, there are uh, you know, lots of, lots of things that uh, can go on. And I, if you pardon me, I'm going to put on my glasses. Oh, sure. <laughs> because I have a hard time with them. OK, uh, I mean, you can talk about uh, such things that uh, are uh, really basic concepts in the study of literature, such as a point of view, or you can study the characters of uh, uh, the um, persons that are involved in the story. Or you can uh, analyze the, the way in which the story is organized. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, you can look for symbols in the story. And that, that's something that students can usually do pretty well. And uh, then uh, they, they, when it comes to the study of poetry, uh, they can study the language that's there and um, the, the kind of images that the poet uh, might use, uh, the, the figures of speech, such as metaphors, uh, and uh, uh, the actual um, uh, prosodic, the, the, the scansion, the, the sound of the poems and so on. There are, there are lots of things that can be taught. Uh, and you would require, uh, with such things, you'd really uh, expect students to concentrate on the work itself and suddenly discover mm -hmm. the kind of light that comes out of the work. What I was talking about just now was uh, uh, getting students who are on their own uh, to um, try to develop something beyond that. And that, that was the, the idea of the talk. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I go ahead. Do you? Um, I don't know if there's a couple questions here about uh, this. I know other people are thinking about it as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for on the one hand, with uh, with kind of our less advanced students, we struggle with getting them beyond summary. Um, yep. With with advanced students, sometimes they get almost mired down in. Um, in their, in their own research. You know, they, they want to talk about the author's life and the context and the history, and mm -hmm. they don't transition very easily to talking about the, um, the literature. And do you have any suggestions for how to get that them? Is, uh, um, the, that is a problem that um, I think that all teachers of uh, advanced literature have. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I have uh, listened to talks that have been given by people who are actual um, full-blown ac academics, <laughs> and I have discovered that that's some of the, one of the problems that sometimes even goes on in very, very advanced levels of discussion. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the thing that uh, is really important in uh, all of these things is to work to make connections. Uh, and uh, you don't expect uh, a, a, a beginning student uh, to go much beyond what, what is there in the text. Uh, you do have a, a, a sort of assumption that students who are uh, upperclassmen, uh, juniors, seniors, uh, even uh, early uh, graduate students, you expect them to be able to bring to bear knowledge that they uh, get elsewhere. But uh, of course, the big problem is that they, once they start talking about something, it becomes very easy not uh, just to continue with that topic 
and not to let it go and not to focus it on the, the material and the text. And that's, that's really one of the tasks of the instructor, mm -hmm. which is to make sure that uh, they know exactly what uh, or how far their research should go. If they, uh, if mm -hmm. they are writing a research paper, it uh, is sort of, I think, beside the point uh, to uh, spend their time uh, talking about the biography of the author, unless, uh, as in the case of Dryden, uh, for example, I sort of spent a little bit of extra time with him, uh, unless uh, there is some way of making connections with the works themselves. And that was what I was suggesting in the uh, talk, was just simply uh, the importance of uh, trying to make uh, the connections with what, what they see in the literature and what, um, what they find from the author's background and life. I think that's, uh, mm -hmm. that, that really is uh, the way in which uh, I would recommend uh, all students or teachers of advanced literature to um, handle the subject of research. And sometimes, mm -hmm. of course, uh, research uh, uh, can become an end in itself, and it does not lead back into a discussion of the works. And mm -hmm. that's where it should all get focused, I think. You know, um, about the, the works that you were discussing today, Susan Grover posted a comment saying, um, the contrasts that you mentioned between the works you discussed were some of the things um, that made the suggested interesting topics. Um, the works ranged history, geography, culture, and theme. Um, and she's wondering, um, how did you, you choose the works that, uh, that you were discussing today? Well, I have never really talked about Dryden's essay on dramatic poetry. Mm -hmm. And I've read it. <laughs> And I, I had some trouble with it too. So when I say when I said it was a hard read, I, I wasn't kidding. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 it's um, it's one of those things which uh, very clearly would never never under any circumstances be given to a group of uh, it could never be given to a group of freshmen. There's just mm -hmm. no way you could expect a freshman to uh, understand what what Dryden is talking about or what the issues are and. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, to, to understand the essay on dramatic poesy, you really have to uh, plow a little bit into some of the kinds of plays that uh, Dryden was writing. And you have to really uh, go ahead and uh, understand some of the things that Shakespeare was writing. And uh, that, of course, is mm -hmm. a little more common. I think many students have that, that kind of background. But uh, when you uh, start talking about heroic drama of uh, the Restoration, that is a topic that not everybody has gone through. And I would say that people who had master's degrees in English have probably never gone through that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, people who have gone on beyond the master's level uh, would, uh, would be able to uh, try to make these connections. Uh, and um, the idea uh, I chose Chinua Achebe uh, as the idea that uh, here is a writer who is, uh, I think, widely read uh, in uh, various uh, uh, schools, um, maybe high schools, perhaps, I don't know, uh, and um, in freshman college courses uh, throughout the United States. And certainly, I think that uh, that book is probably read in schools, advanced uh, uh, courses in uh, literature in uh, Africa. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of course, the comparison between uh, Achebe and um, Joseph Conrad, uh, it's a natural connection to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the fact is that Achebe uh, actually did write an essay on what he considered to be Conrad's racism, which uh, I, have, I have never really quite uh, followed, uh, but I will have to go through that and do some consideration of it. Uh, and. Um, I thought uh, that since Dryden was talking about the expansion of English literature uh, throughout uh, the um, developing Western world, uh, it would be a convenient uh, kind of uh, connection to uh, take an American work, a short poem like that of William Cullen Bryant, and point out uh, that uh, uh, you uh, just as Dryden was visualizing people going out to the outside world and bringing English literature to people's attention, why certainly what 
Thomas Cole was doing was bringing uh, and, and considering uh, American painting uh, to the European. It's sort of a, a reverse process, which uh, took place over a century and a half. Uh, and it's very interesting that uh, Bryant uh, saw that as a possibility. Uh, and um, uh, one always can introduce Poe. I love Poe. And, uh, <laughs> so I hope that uh, sort of gets at what was, what was being asked. Yeah, I, I think so. And, I, and a related question is, um, you know, you you're, you talk about making con 